Good morning, everyone. I would just like us to begin this time together today just by thinking about some words that our moderator has written on the prayer guide for this week. This prayer guide is available for everyone. You can download it from our Facebook page and also from our church website. Our moderator writes, This week we have suspended the usual and expected content of this prayer guide to focus on the global COVID-19 pandemic that is unfolding in front of us. We are people of prayer and our first resort in times of uncertainty is towards the one who is in ultimate control. To quote the late Dr Billy Graham, we are to pray in times of adversity, lest we become faithless and unbelieving. We are to pray in times of prosperity, lest we become boastful and proud. We are to pray in times of danger, lest we become fearful and doubting. We are to pray in times of security, lest we become self-sufficient. Right now we take our lead from the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, where he had once been beaten and imprisoned. Paul tells the believers in the book of Philippians not to worry, or to be anxious about anything. Instead, Paul instructs them that they should pray for God's blessing and make supplication for his protection and do it all with thanksgiving. We are asked today to pray. We're to pray today for our health service. Pray for those who work in health care, whether they are nurses, porters, doctors, carers, ancillary staff, pharmacists or suppliers. We're to pray for safety and strength as they work. Pray for stamina, resilience and also for protection at this time. Pray for the NHS staff as they as the staff cancel operations, as they reorganise services and learn how to best deal with this great upheaval. Pray for those who have been awaiting operations and now have to deal with the disappointment of their appointment being cancelled. Ask God to grant them patience while they continue to deal with their own discomfort and pain. Pray for first responders who are tasked with triaging, testing and treating increasing numbers of people who arrive in hospitals suffering from the COVID-19 virus. Ask God to give them patience, wisdom and a gentle spirit as they work to navigate fears and offer effective treatment. I would encourage you now in your own homes just to just to pause this video and just to take a few moments to pray about these things. We're now going to read together from God's Word as we read Psalm 12. Help, Lord, for no one is faithful anymore. Those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. Everyone lies to their neighbour, they flatter with their lips, but harbour deception in their hearts. May the Lord silence all flattering lips and every boastful tongue. Those who say by our tongues we will prevail, our own lips will defend us, who is Lord over all. Because the poor are plundered and the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those who malign them. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. You, Lord, will keep the needy safe and will protect us forever from the wicked who freely strut about when what is vile is honoured by the human race. And we pray that God will bless to each and every one of us this reading from his word. Psalm 12. What is it we do whenever the world goes wrong? And we ask ourselves that sometimes, don't we? Why is the world so messed up? Why does life just seem to fall apart so easily? And in one form or another, questions like this, they, they keep pressing us for an answer. 
they're almost as persistent as that constant stream of WhatsApps from your teenager's friends. And the answers to these questions may come in almost as many forms as the questions themselves. But one answer that cannot be overlooked is that which is found in Psalm 12. Because in his passionate plea for help in a world gone wrong, the psalmist brings us to an understanding of how this has happened. And more than that, he brings us to understand what God can do about a world that has gone wrong. I want us to think first of all today about the basic problem of the faithful. And we just read verse 1 again. Help, Lord, for no one is faithful anymore. Those who are loyal have vanished from the human race. And this is a, a, a grim analysis from David. Apparently whole communities were rejecting the ways of God. Whole clans were turning their backs on their religious heritage. The outlook was dark, rebellion was rife, and the faithful, well, they were few. In fact, the psalmist's description of this rebellion really catches our eye. His picture of the waywardness of the people was so dark that we almost brace ourselves to hear the worst about the conduct of these rebels. But these people were not involved in idolatry or violence or viciousness. This complaint of the psalmist about the, the widespread backsliding, it was all about words. But they were lying and arrogant words. Look at verses 2 to 4. Everyone lies to their neighbour. They flatter with their lips but harbour deception in their hearts. May the Lord silence all flattering lips and every boastful tongue. Those who say by our tongues we will prevail. Our own lips will defend us. Who is Lord over us? What is it that's so wrong with lying words? Well, you know, to answer this, we have to go back to the very beginning of human history. Because whenever God originated humanity in his image, he equipped them with the gift of speech. And the first human words that are recorded in the Bible are words that show us what words are for. And they are words of fellowship. We read in Genesis, Genesis 2 and verse 23. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And Adam's words about Eve remind us that, that words are for helping, for valuing and for supporting another person. And Adam was a man who left no doubt in Eve's mind that he was open to her. And using words, he was building this bridge from his heart to her heart. With words, he was opening up, he was disclosing his mind to her. And with words, he was affirming her in her womanhood. And he was absolutely pledging to her his love. And that's what words are for. And this is why a world full of lying words strikes such terror in the psalmist's soul. Lying is an insult to God who made us for better things. It's also an insult to our neighbour who deserves better of us. You see, without truth, fellowship is impossible. There can be no real sharing whenever deceit crowds out honesty. And lying in itself is a form of violence because it takes a pure relationship and it abuses it. And that's why lying words are wrong. What's so wrong with a flattering tongue? And you know, this question too takes us back to the beginning. The tongue was given not only to enable fellowship, but also for worship of the one true God. They were made for prayer and not for pride. And with them we express our dependence, not our self-reliance. You see, the disloyal persons that are spoken about in this psalm, they viewed the tongue not as an instrument of praise, but as a weapon of attack, a tool for manipulation and getting their own way. And we might say, well, they were just words. But you see, words are a badge of our faith. 
and how we use them in public and private gives evidence of how seriously we really do take our profession of Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. In 1973, the politician Harry Motes in the West Virginia House of Delegates, in the prayer before the beginning of business, he used words that can speak to all of us. Lord, make our words gracious and tender. We may have to eat them tomorrow. But secondly, today I want to want us all to think about the Lord's own answer to the faithful. You see, the psalmist had pleaded for help. He had brought his need to God in the temple. The Lord not only heard his plea, but he also answered it in a more dramatic way than we find in most other of the Psalms. You see, usually the sufferer laid their request before God and then accepted by faith the fact that God would answer. But here the answer itself was given in verse 5. Because the poor are plundered and the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them. From those who malign them. You see the deceitfulness of the wicked had gone far enough. Innocent people were being hurt by it. To them God clearly and personally promised his protection. Exalting the humble and putting down the proud. That was the way that God worked then. And the same is true now. Words were the problem. We have seen that. <laughs> Nevertheless words were also the answer. With lying and arrogant words, the world goes wrong. But with saving, rescuing words, God protects his people. Evil words, they are powerful. They cut, they maim, they bite and they sting. But the healing words of God are even more powerful. And the psalmist was glad to hear them. But thirdly today, I want us to think about the final response of the faithful. The psalmist was Glad to hear those words of God because he knew how reliable they were. In verse 6. And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. Whenever the psalmist compares God's promises to silver and to gold, he, he thought about the purity of their truth. You see, contaminated and corrupt speech is part of our broken and fallen humanity. It's, it's tarnished. It looks more like lead than silver or gold. And that's why our ultimate human hope lies not in our word, but in God's words. And that's some of, that hymn of praise that we have here in verse 6. After that, the psalmist goes back. He returns to his plea for help in verses 7 and 8. You, Lord, will keep the needy safe and will protect us forever from the wicked who freely strut about when what is vile is honoured by the human race. And he returned to this plea, not in despair, but in great confidence. His circumstances hadn't changed much. The, the wicked were still on the prowl. But you see, they hadn't been in the temple like he had. They hadn't heard those reassuring words of God. They had not been transformed by this promise that God was for them in the midst of their poverty. But the psalmist, well, he had. And his voice rang with assurance as he renewed his plea for God's help. The power of words. There are many examples, you know, that illustrate this. Prisoners of war returning from North Vietnam have given a, a moving account of the power of words. In solitary confinement, they, they tapped out messages to each other on the walls. Prisoners assigned to sweep the yards outside of their cells, they used their brooms as transmitters and they used swishes instead of taps. They brought daily greetings and, and news bulletins about prison life. Words that brought news, words that kept lonely men in touch with each other and to some words that brought eternal life. Passages of scripture, verses of hymns, simple prayers were sent from cell to cell, pointing individuals to that word that became flesh and lived among us. 
the power of words there. Part of what's wrong with a world where, where speech can malign and attack, abuse and demean. But words are also part of the way that God gives us strength, hope and courage to live in the midst of the world. And beyond the words of the world are the words of God, bringing healing in place of hurt, help instead of harm. And beyond the words of God is the word of God. Jesus Christ, our saviour, who alone speaks that message of life. And we as believers are his representatives. And our words should be such that our devotion and commitment to the word of life is obvious in our daily living. May our words, our words, be words that are not destructive. Let us all just pray together. Father, in the midst of all the speech that we hear around us, some foolish, some impure, some evil, give us ears to hear your voice. Let it be your words about our Saviour and his words about you that we really listen to. In his great name we pray. Amen.